Hello, everybody, and welcome to Verbum Day. It is good to be with you today. Verbum Day is the lectionary podcast of Transcendent Truth Media Network. You can find out more about who we are and what we do at www.transcendenttruthmedia.com. We encourage you to visit us there and read some of our blog articles, listen to some of our other podcasts, and also take a look at some of the other things we got going on. Our goal, as always, is to provide high-quality, free resources for the proclamation of the gospel. And especially in this lectionary podcast, that's really our goal, is the proclamation of the gospel and of Christ crucified for you. And that is a wonderful message, especially as Lutherans, that we get to bring every single Sunday through God's word in the sermon. So I am your host today, Pastor Roland Weisbrot. Our usual host, uh, Pastor Connor Longafi, is is busy this week, so I am here with you, and I'm excited to be here with you because I'm actually not preaching this Sunday. Um, I work at a church with another pastor, and so he's preaching this Sunday rather than me. So I get a chance to engage with these these texts, even though I'm not preaching this week. And of course, if you know, it is Holy Trinity Sunday this week, according to year C of the lectionary and we are going to be looking at four readings today and I'm going to be reading from the new revised standard version so the first reading that we're going to be looking at is Proverbs 8 1 through 4 and 22 to 31 so I'll just read that quickly does not wisdom call and understanding raise her voice on the heights beside the way at the crossroads she takes her stand, beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals she cries out, To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all who live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up, at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there was no depths I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields, or the world's first bits of soil, when he established the heavens, I was there, when he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was his daily delight, playing before him always, playing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. The word of the Lord. So anytime we preach on Holy Trinity Sunday, it's always a bit of a task, as I'm sure everyone can understand. Anyone who's studied Trinitarian theology even a little bit, and even just your average Christian that knows of the doctrine of the Trinity, knows it's infinitely more complicated. And the best part is the more you study it, the less you understand. And this is because, I mean, quite frankly, this is one of those doctrines that just goes way above our heads. It is a doctrine that requires faith because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that one plus one plus one equals one. It doesn't make sense that there's three persons and yet one God. And yet here as Christians, this is what we boldly confess. This is what we proclaim. This is what we believe scripture to proclaim. This is what we believe and affirm in the creeds of the church, the apostles, the Nicene, and of course the Athanasian Creed, which usually this is the only Sunday of the year that the Athanasian Creed is read, mostly because it's, it's very, very long. And yet it gives us a very good summary of the Trinitarian thought of Christianity. Now, of course, when we're dealing with Proverbs here, it is not uncommon for people to understand this particular portion of Proverbs to be speaking about Jesus Christ, especially um, verses 22 to 31. Now, there's a little trouble here because, of course, in verse 22, it says, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work. Um, so, and one of the footnotes says, or it can be read, uh, or the Lord created me as the beginning of his work. 
So, of course, we as Christians don't say that Jesus Christ was created because, you know, if we remember back to the Arian controversy where Arius was basically going around saying there was a time when Christ was not, which the church universally affirmed to be blasphemy. But through the rest of this passage, it's really interesting. It shows the primacy of Christ, but also the co-eternality with Christ. It makes it very clear. Christ was there before the foundations of the earth. Christ was there before anything had been created or designed or put together. Christ was there before the sun, before the moon, before the earth, before the soil, before the stars in the sky, before the seas were given their limits and on and on and on. And verse 30 really affirms this. And then I was beside him like a master worker. So Christ partook in creation. Now, this is, of course, echoed especially in the book of John, John 1 in particular, which isn't our gospel reading for today, where it talks about in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then it goes on to talk about how through the word all things were created. And this, this is a theme brought out many times in the New Testament, but also is very present in the Old Testament. We think about uh, creation as, as recorded in Genesis 1 and 2. Well, what does God do? God speaks creation into existence through his creative word. So the word has always been there, right? Jesus Christ is the word and he's always been there. So there's a lot of richness that you can take as a preacher from this text and say, look, um, this Christ is here in the beginning. It's not the Father just kind of chilling out like, I'm going to create a bunch of things. I'll, get, I'll create this Jesus dude. I'll create this Holy Spirit dude. And then we'll create all the rest of creation. No, no, no. The Trinity is already there. And out of the Trinity comes the creation. The Father wills. The Son um, speaks. Essentially, the Son is the Word, and then the Holy Spirit is the one that enacts the rest, and is kind of the traditional Christian way of looking at it, certainly a way that Augustine would understand it, among others. And so, really, this is, this is a rich text. And, and my kind of suggestion would be to anyone preaching on Holy Trinity Sunday, especially if you want the focus to be on the doctrine of the Trinity, what you're going to be preaching is very much a catechetical sermon rather than a sort of typical law gospel sermon. Of course, there's plenty of room for law and gospel, but I think the approach I would take on a Sunday like this is, is much more catechetical, talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. I mean, really, it's only once a year that that this comes out, and I think it's, it's valuable to talk about. And it's also important as Christians for us to understand exactly who Christ is, in his relationship with the economy of the Trinity and how this isn't just another man, but indeed is God and man. And by virtue of that two natures in Christ, in the one person of Christ, we can be redeemed because God alone can forgive sins, which Jesus is the son of God and he is God, but only <clears throat> humans can bear the punishment for their own sin. And so he is fully human and therefore is able to take our iniquities upon himself. And in this blessed exchange, both forgive and um, take on sin in this glorious paradox uh, called the cross. And so really speaking of this Trinitarian theology immediately sorts to bolster, sort of bolsters and reinforces Christology as well. And that's why these discussions are important, I think. Now, I mean, preaching about this in a way that makes sense to parishioners who may vary in their knowledge, theological knowledge, or their ability to understand different concepts, um, especially abstract thinking. Some people are stronger at that than others. You really have to find creative ways of trying to explain these things. But you also don't want to get into the, oh, analogy this, analogy that, analogy this, because a lot of times when you try to use analogies for the Trinity, it ends up in a some sort of heresy, which Lutheran satire made fun of with the um, some of their videos as well. How, yeah, St. Patrick, of course, is um, 
in this sort of sat satirical sketch, he goes to Ireland, tries to tell them about the Trinity, and he tries to use all these different examples, and 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 basically these two um, Irish peasants who pretend to be completely unknowledgeable on the topic are are mocking him because they're saying, well, well, that's modalism or that's Arianism or that's whatever it is, and so that's kind of fun. So anyway, long story short, you, you have to be careful when you're preaching about the Trinity. And I think one of my favorite comments made by one of my theological professors was, if you talk about the Trinity too long, you'll probably become a heretic. So touch on the topic, highlight what's important to highlight, and then move on. It would be my suggestion. Okay, so Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouths of babes and infants. You have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are humans that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the work of your hands. And you have put all things under their feet, all the sheep and oxen and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The word of the Lord. So this is also interesting. This is a, uh, one of the Psalms of David really praising God and thanking him for his his goodness, but also his mindfulness of humanity. You know, when we really take the time to consider that God created all of this, you know, this whole vast universe, which we have only explored a fraction of a fraction of, of everything God created, it is, it is truly overwhelming. It is truly overwhelming that God even cares about what would be, you know, little less than a speck of sand on a very large beach. And yet he is mindful of us and he does care for us as individuals and as communities. And so that's a that's a wonderful thing. So this kind of ties into the Trinitarian um, doctrine as well, because although this is the God that creates, this triune God is also the God that seeks relationship and is, is mindful of what he created and cares for what he created. And also this helps to highlight humanity's role in this. God has given humanity a very dignified and honorable position, which cannot be ignored and should not be ignored. Humanity has been blessed by God in this way. We have our responsibilities. We have our tasks that he has set us out to, and he has only made us a little lower than, than himself. And this is truly amazing. And I think the medievals, really understood this a lot better because of their concept of the great chain of being as well and how uh, you know of course god being at the top and then if i remember correctly it's god at the top then there's angels and then there's humanity and then so on and so forth you go down um i think there's probably a, it's a little different admittedly my medieval um philosophical metaphysical stuff is a little rusty but long story short there's this great chain of being and and human humanity is pretty high on it and that that's w significant and worth noting and so when we encounter this text we encounter a another aspect of our triune god but also a better understanding of who and what we are and the position in the cosmos that we have which i think is a good way of relating what this glorious trinity um means for us so to speak what what this doctrine means the glory of the trinity but also the relation of the trinity to humanity at least that's the approach i would probably take on it once again you can do what you want <laughs> you can pray about it and discern and i'm sure you i'm sure you'll have better ideas than me but that's that's the approach i would take and so the next thing we've got here is our epistle reading, which comes to us from Acts chapter 2. Um, and right here we have uh, verses 14 and then 22 to 36. So it's 14a and 22 to 36. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. 
Fellow Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know, this man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having released him from the agony of death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I must say to you confidently of our ancestor David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with him an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on the throne. For seeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, he, will not, he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of, all of, and of that all of us are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you have crucified. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> Pardon me. So once again, here we have another stunning example of uh, Christology seeing very clearly that Jesus is this anointed one of God and Jesus has these these powers these godlike powers because he is more than just the anointed one he is the son of God and he is fully divine just as he is fully human and so at the end of the day although this is a more Christologically focused passage once again Christology is is absolutely essential to an understanding of the Trinity and why is this because at the end of the day Christ is the way in which God has chosen to disclose himself to the world so the incarnate God man Jesus Christ is the fullest expression of revelation of God so through Christology you can understand better everything, including the nature and person and being of the Trinity. We cannot know the Father, really, except through Christ. We cannot know the Spirit except through Christ. We cannot know so many things except through Christ. So even though it's a Christological focus, it is through Christ that we know the rest. And, I mean, at the end of the day, look at what Jesus says about himself. I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, says Jesus in the Gospel of John. And so really, all Christology ultimately also points to Trinitarian theology. And so really, the, the position that you can take here is once again reinforcing the idea that this Jesus is someone very significant, someone very special, someone different through what's being spoken of him, through the prophecy from David, also through uh, the, the different things that he did during his life, through the fact of the resurrection and all of these things. So now, if you're dealing with this Messiah, of course, well, how does he fit with the rest? Uh, how does he fit with the Israelite understanding of God? Right now, of course, you're dealing with Jews. Jews in this time, of course, and currently even now, are devoutly and fiercely monotheistic. So how do you fit this Jesus guy into the monotheistic uh, experience, into the monotheistic language? Well, this is one of the things that the early apostles were having to wrestle with and having to clarify by looking at the Old Testament and showing examples of the Trinity, of the, the three persons, even long before the, the doctrine of the Trinity was so well fleshed out. Because of course, the fuller the rev the fullness of revelation came through Christ and that became more clear that we have this trinity but the trinity is all throughout the old testament as well and this is exemplified in many of today's passages 
but also in this as well. And I think Peter makes a very good case about who Jesus is, what he did, and his place in the Trinity. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do here, Christologically, Trinitarian-wise. There's also a lot of really great opportunities for a law gospel dialectic here, putting to death us sinners and raising us with the good news of the gospel, because um, Peter uses some pretty accusatory language here. You know, you put him to death, you killed him, you your sin did this, and yet God has raised him from the dead, and so that means there's hope for you and for me. And so there's so much you can do with this text. And in fact, like if I were to pick a text to preach on this this week, you know, I'd, I'd probably preach on this text just because there's just about a million things you can do with it. All right, moving into the gospel, our last text for Trinity Sunday. So this is John chapter 8, 48 to 59. The Jews answered him, are you... Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever keeps my word will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know you that you have a demon. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say, whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? The prophets also died. Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, he of whom you say he is our God, though you do not know him, but I know him. If I would say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him, and I keep his word. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have seen and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The Gospel of our Lord. Now, this is perhaps one of my favorite Gospel passages. You know, as, as any good Lutheran will say, what's your favorite Gospel? The Gospel of John. <laughs> Why the heavy Christology in here? There's, there is a great, great revelations about Christ in specific in the Gospel of John. And this is perhaps one of the greatest ones because here, it is here that Jesus makes an explicit divinity claim about himself by using the divine name to refer to himself. Of course, when we look at the Old Testament, when we look at the book of Exodus, what's going on? Moses is called out by God out of Egypt and then is told, look, you need to deliver my people. I have heard their cry. You must deliver my people, Israel. And he says, you know, after trying to say no, eventually he says, okay, well, what am I going to say your name is, Lord, when I go to proclaim to the Israelites? And God answers by saying, um, Yahweh would be our modern uh, translation of it, but it's basically the uh, Hebrew letters yod He vav He. So uh, in English, Y-W-H-W. -W. And that means I am that I am. So the great I am, the I am, is an explicitly divine statement. Now, of course, one of the commandments that we know is, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Well, the Jews were very paranoid about misusing the name of God. So they would never use the title Yahweh. They would tend to uh, fill it with something like Hashem, which mean, meant the name, or Kyrios, which just meant Lord, or whatever. They would find a different way of saying the divine name so that they didn't have to say the divine name. Everyone knew that they were referring to the divine name. But so just because they were so paranoid about use, misusing the divine name, they pretty much never said it. And so for Jesus to come along and attribute the divine name to himself, not only was blasphemy because you're misusing the divine name, at least from the perspective of the Jews, but that you dare to use the name of God in reference to yourself, that you somehow also are God. 
Now, of course, this is offensive to the Jews on a multiple levels. One, there's only one God, and Jesus was also claiming to be God, which they have a problem with. But two, that, that Jesus was claiming to be God at all, despite being, a, you know, at least in their eyes, like a completely human, just as they were human, was just absolutely and utterly unacceptable, un, unacceptable in the highest degree. So this is truly one of the greatest revelations in all of scripture, really. And this is why, you know, verse 59 says they, they were ready to stone this stone Jesus to death because that, that's how radical his claim was. They're, they're like, this guy's clearly a heretic. This guy's clearly messed in the head. He needs to die. He's blasphemed in the worst way that he can possibly blaspheme. He has claimed to be God himself. And now, of course, this makes it a rich text for Trinitarian Sunday once again because of Christology. Because if we understand Christologically that Jesus is God, that ultimately, once again, as I've mentioned before, brings up a discussion about the Trinity. Because why, of course? Well, the Father can't, you know, we're, we're monotheists. So the Father, the, the traditional thought would be the Father can't be God and the Son can't also be God. There's no way, you know, one plus one is two, not one. And so, Naturally, if we're going to make the claim that Jesus is God, just as the Father is God, and for that record, the Holy Spirit is God, well, there's got to be a discussion about the Trinity, the triune God. And so, really, this is a this is a wonderfully rich text that helps us clarify who Jesus is in his divinity rather than his humanity, in particular in this text, but also it helps us to define greater the Trinity and uh, have a better understanding of Christ's place in that Trinity and the fact that Christ was and always was with the Father and the Holy Spirit, co-eternal. And that, I think, you, you couldn't ask for a, a more clear claim. So any, <laughs> there's a lot of sort of pseudo pseudo you know pseudo intellectuals and and atheists and and folks that will run around and say well jesus never claimed to be god um yes he did john 8 58 <laughs> jesus said to them very truly i tell you before abraham was i am pretty hard to get around that that is an explicit divine claim a claim to divinity so anytime you hear someone say well jesus never claimed to be god that was just an invention of the later church Show them John 8, 58, and say, explain this then to me, please. Thank you. So Jesus does claim very clearly to be God. And once again, there's so much you can do from a homiletical perspective, from a proclamation perspective with this text. And also, um, what's interesting is just as the Jews rejected this claim back in the time so there's many many people in this day that will reject this claim now but we as christians accept this claim and therefore accept also um, the doctrine of the trinity so those are our texts for this trinity sunday i hope that you found this conversation helpful if you're um, a pastor or a preacher of some sort and you're preparing for uh, preaching this Sunday, maybe these these thoughts have helped spurred on something. But even if you're you're a layperson and you're ready to hear the sermon on Sunday, well, now you have perhaps an ability to have sharper ears to hear the good news. So whether you're on the pulpit side or in, you're on the pew side, I hope this has benefited you. Thank you for joining me, and may God bless you on this Trinity Sunday. May you hear the word proclaimed in truth and in power through the Holy Spirit, and may you hear of Christ dying for you for your sins. That is always our hope. That is always our desire. God's blessings to you. Take care, and thanks for listening. Bye now.